Good morning. I am delighted to be here in the cool part of California. Uh, Reading was pushing 100 degrees the other day, and I expect it's going to be like that when we get back. So, uh, good to be here. We hear all the time in this world, we need to come together. Let's be unified. But the actions of so many in power belie their true desire to divide and conquer. We actually saw this reality in responses to the horrific shooting in Texas last week. The words and the reality don't match. In this election season, isn't it over? We see the come together message in one breath and attacks on the opponent in the next. Come together is propaganda, not a sincere desire. We see it every day in our world. This is the very way Satan conspires to keep his own sway on the earth. Until the day that Jesus returns to conquer Satan and evil and death. And doesn't Satan use his wiles to divide the church too? Even in the book of Acts and in Paul's letters, we see evidence of the disunity. But we also see unity at points. And that unity is a blessed thing when it occurs. In the Bible, I think of the Last Supper, or Pentecost, or the gatherings in Acts 4 when the disciples met together to uh, break bread and pray and listen to the teachings of the apostles. Acts 7, where they came to agreement on a dispute between the widows, or in Acts 15, when they uh, came to a decision about circumcision. Paul's praise of the Thessalonians that their unity had been had gone out through Macedonia. Or uh, John's expression of his joy at the love shown in the church in 2 John. And I finally think of the vast acclamation of peoples before the throne of God and of the Lamb in Revelation 4 and 5 and 7. Today, I want to talk about Jesus' prayer to be unified in John 17. We don't often think about Jesus praying for us, but Jesus prayed for his followers and for us. And his primary prayer was for our unity in unity with Jesus and the Father. Before getting to John 17, though, I'd like to consider disunity just a little bit more. I would boil down everything to the idolatry of our own self-centered desires. I desire what I want, and if it conflicts with your desire for what you want, then we'll duke it out. And may the best person win. When desires conflict, fights ensue. And with no mediation or compromise, some sort of violence will happen. Maybe not physically, but someone gets hurt, sidelined scapegoated, and resentment and plans for revenge spring up. But is that what God wants? And is that what Jesus came to bring about? I think we all know that the answer is no. God desires the opposite for his children. 
Jesus' entire incarnation was given over to that desire of God to redeem a people for himself who together glorified God with their own hearts. When, when we turn to John 17, we not only see Jesus praying that believers might be unified, but we see how this can happen. What stands out in this prayer is a single term. Jesus speaks of the oneness between him and the Father over and again. And his desire for all those who believe in him to participate in that oneness. Let me go to our reading for the day. John 17, 20 to 23. I don't ask only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word, so that all might be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, so that also they might be in us, so that the world might believe that you sent me. And I have given them the glory that you have given me. I in them, and you in me, so they might be completely as one. So that the world might know that you sent me and loved them as you loved me. There are so many aspects to this prayer. First, Jesus limits his prayer. Though the world might be the ultimate end, the focus is on those who believe in Jesus as the one the Father sent. The unity Jesus prays for is a unity not just between believers, but a participation in the unity of the Godhead. We don't see a horizontal unity, but a vertical unity. Any unity that the church has on a horizontal plane flows from the vertical unity not the other way around. As believers participate in the unity of the Godhead, then the world beholds the glory of God. Let me say a word about the world here. The world in John is the world of humanity. And normally, humanity arrayed against God and his purposes. But God loves the world in spite of hatred for and rejection of God. The church is composed of former world people who have given up fighting God and instead have received his love through the gift of Jesus. Now, the church is the face of God to the world, so that the world might believe that you sent me, Jesus said. The church itself becomes the sign that God sent Jesus into the world. But that sign is only effective as the church, believers, participates in the unity of Jesus and the Father. So while the ultimate, the ultimate trajectory of this passage may be the world, the focus is on the body of believers, the church. 
Next, let me say a word about glory. Jesus says that he has given them the glory that God has given him. What does he mean by that? Replace glory with the idea of reputation or character. I have given them the reputation you have given me. Or I have given them the divine character that you have given me. Jesus' entire revelatory purpose was to show the world who God is. And he has done that by revealing himself to those who respond. Jesus' desire in the prayer is for the church to embody, to reflect, to live out the very character of God. Jesus himself embodied this character as the word of God in the flesh. No one has ever seen God, John 1.18 proclaimed. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. Now we make him known. Jesus finishes this prayer, verses 24 to 26, as so many prayers do, by repetition of sorts. But meaningful repetition that brings emphasis and perspective. Let's take each verse in turn. Father, what you've given me, I desire that where I am also they might be with me so they can behold my glory, which you gave me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus directly addresses God as Father and expresses a desire a want for those he has poured his life into. He desires for them, us, to be with him in the eternal presence of God, where he has been from eternity. I think of um, the amazing scene in Revelation 4, 5, and 7, where people from every people, nation, tribe, and tongue are together praising God and the Lamb. Jesus knows that the Father loves him, and he wants us to know and experience that same love. Jesus then returns again to the world. Humanity who has rejected Jesus as the revelation of God in contrast to his followers. Righteous Father, the world did not know you, but I knew you, and these knew that you sent me, and I made known to them your name, and made it known so that the love which you loved me might be in them, and I also in them. This final rewording of previous parts of the prayer place an exclamation on several things that are mindful and beautiful takeaways. First, God is righteous, Father. God is good. God is true. God is just. And his intention in sending Jesus was out of God's character of love and a desire to save the world. Second, Jesus acknowledges that the world did not know God. Interesting that Jesus does not close the door on their rejection, but he does truthfully state eternity. 
The world still hates Jesus and those who proclaim his name. Third, Jesus states once again, as he has so many times, that the Father has sent him and revealed him. A few days later, after the resurrection, Jesus will commission his disciples with the words, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Finally, the end of love. The Father loves the Son, and the Son desires for that same love to embed itself into his followers. True oneness in the church comes when we together focus all of our attention on God, the three in one. As we do, we are not looking at each other but together, as one, to the one who loves us, who strengthens us, who sends us. The world has no ability to counter this type of love. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome.